Next on Primary Care, multiple myeloma. Community awareness can lead to better health outcomes for many African Americans. The more that we talk about myeloma and how this affects our community, the more likely that, that, that lady that I worry about going to church will engage somebody that says, yeah, I heard about that. Hello, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, and welcome to Primary Care, the show dedicated to improving the health of African Americans. Multiple myeloma is a rare and incurable blood cancer affecting a person's white plasma cells. African Americans are twice as likely to develop myeloma compared to white Americans and are more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age. One reason for this disparity is the incredibly low level of awareness about the disease in the African American community. Even amongst primary care physicians, there is not enough awareness about myeloma. Here to increase our knowledge on this topic is Dr. Craig Cole. Dr. Cole is Director of Clinical Research in Hematology, Oncology, and Multiple Myeloma at the Michigan State University Carmanos Cancer Institute. He works extensively with patient advocacy groups to educate communities about myeloma and has led multiple clinical trials discovering new therapies. Dr. Cole, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Good, we're so pleased to have you. Uh, probably long overdue. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Good. Dr. Cole, tell us what is, for our, for our viewing audience, what is myeloma? Yeah, just like you had put in the um, intro, multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. And so the plasma cells, you know, are the cells in our bone marrow that produce antibodies and help um, us fight infection. And just like any other part of the body, those cells can become cancerous. And so when those plasma cells that live inside the bone marrow become cancerous, that is what we call multiple myeloma. Is there a known cause? That's a super good question. And we have been trying to figure that out for the past 50 years. And we really don't know what causes myeloma, probably because it's a lot of little things that happen throughout our life. So we get exposed to different infections. Our immune systems have to do lots of things throughout our lifetime. Every time our immune system has to fight an infection or get exposed to an antigen, those plasma cells have to mutate, create a new antibody, then move on. And the idea is that over decades and decades and decades of those mutations happening in the plasma cells, some of those plasma cell mutations stick. They become, mono, they become clonal and then eventually could lead to multiple myeloma. So basically, there may be no known risk factors, or can you point to a few things that say, yes, you may develop a myeloma? Yes, so just like you had mentioned that African Americans and really people of African descent around the world are twice as likely to get multiple myeloma. So one group that we really have to have in mind are people of African descent, because their risk is higher than in really than any other risk in, of anybody else in the world. Also, there's a family history component. And so, and that is also very specific to African Americans as, com as compared to whites. Black people are more likely to, in patients that have myeloma, their siblings and children are more likely to have the precursor disease to myeloma, the monoclonal gammopathy, the intersignificance, or MGAS, which could turn into myeloma. So is myeloma directly hereditary? Not so much, but the precursor disease is yes, hereditary, yes. and especially for black patients. Yeah. yeah, I just saw one the other day in the office. So what about signs and symptoms? Not just that the patient should be aware of, but the physicians also. Yes, that, um, I know I'm gonna say that's a really good question over and over again, but that's a, that's a beautiful question because the trick about myeloma is it can masquerade for a lot of other different things. So the number one thing that patients present with when they have myeloma to their primary care provider is bone pain. So not much bone fractures, not, much, not so much bone breaks, but bone pain. And, and, if, and usually that happens about seven months before they actually get diagnosed. That, will, that bone pain can then progress into increasing fatigue, which again is very common, more back pain, and then anemia, 
and then it kind of cascades from there. Yeah, so grandma is saying, my bones hurt and I'm tired and you need to pay attention and think myeloma. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, do I always think about myeloma with an, an Asian person mm -hmm. or Native American person? The incidence of myeloma is so low, that wouldn't be the first thing on my mind. Mm -hmm. For someone of African descent, because the disease is so much more common, it is the most common blood cancer among, among African-American adults. We nearly need to be thinking about this disease when those subtle signs and symptoms come about. So how do we make the diagnosis? Yes, yes, and so three tests, so only three tests. So one thing that, that and one is the SPEP, the serum protein electrophoresis. Those plasma cells, unlike a lot of other cancers, those plasma cells produce a protein that can, we can detect in the blood. And there are three tests to, to find that. The serum protein electrophoresis will find the heavy chain, so the IgG, IgA, and IgM that we always talk about. And that test will pick up about 88% of myeloma. It's that high? It's that high. Um, the free light chain assay. And so we really don't recommend checking the Bench Jones protein or the urine, 24 hour urine test because they're inaccurate. Um, they're insensitive compared to the free light chain assay. So the free light chain assay then fills in that 12% that is missed by the SPAP. And the immunofixation test will then identify the type of protein that it is. If it's IgA, IgG, or IgM, because IgM is more likely to be Waldenstrom's macrogabulinemia, more common in whites than in blacks. Collecting that 24-hour urine was a challenge 30 oh. years ago. It's a challenge now, believe me. What about treatment? Treatments have been truly revolutionary, truly revolutionary, and I say that because the life expectancy of myeloma patients used to be one to two years mm -hmm. back when I was in medical school. The improvements in myeloma, we've had a, a doubling in the survival of myeloma patients over the past 20 years, and now more than 60% of patients can expect to live five years with this disease. And the treatment, and, and really that is an underestimate because the treatments have just changed just a few months ago. We now use a four drug induction therapy that has a 100% response rate. And of that 100%, 80% will have deep, deep responses that will last for long periods of time. 80%. 80%. 80%. Um, 80%. That's the, are, are we doing 80% in, in other this areas? Is the, That's amazing. You, 100, you are absolutely true. When I first started doing this, you know, when I had hair, <laughs> and we were giving melphalan and pregnizone, the, re, the overall response rate was 30%, 36% for melphalan and pregnizone. In the time that I've been doing hematology and multiple myeloma, that has gone from 30% to 99%. The deep responses, just like you mentioned, are like 80, 88%. And so it has been, I mean, it has been an incredible ride to see these changes. And now my patients, where I used to, you know, we used to talk a lot of doom and gloom when we first met them. Now, I just saw a patient yesterday and told her, a new patient yesterday, that this disease is very treatable. And how long will you live with this disease? I don't, I don't know, know. Because the, the uh, innovations keep coming and coming and coming. Now, isn't that nice to practice in an arena where we, we can compare, where we used to say, oh, six months, get your life in order, or a year, and now we're saying, let's see what you look like in five <laughs> years, okay? That is, uh, it, it's, it's incredible. And what is going to happen, the things, the new therapies that are coming about, especially getting the T cells to fight the myeloma cells, we have, the innovations have been incredible and we really don't even know where it's gonna go because the, the clinical trials are happening so quickly and, and they're so successful. So, so what should the primary care side of my practice or any primary care practice, what should we be doing in terms of this whole approach to myeloma? Yeah, so the first thing is being aware and how to diagnose it. 55% of myeloma patients are discovered in a primary care clinic. So I don't, I rarely diagnose myeloma. They're all that referrals is, then. They're all referrals from primary care docs that were aware that this disease exists. 
And again, three tests that will diagnose 100% of the myeloma patients. And so if you have a patient that has anemia, I see patients all, anemia is always due to something. You know, when my family says I'm anemic, I always say, well, what are you anemic from? And if you have a patient that had that's, you know, over age 55 or over age 50, has anemia, yes, we do iron tests, we do, you know, B12 tests, but we can do three tests, rule out myeloma. If there's no myeloma, you're done. And you, and you successfully ruled it out. Those iron tests aren't that accurate in being able to rule in or rule out anything. So being aware of it, and then making their referrals. Um, and what I mean by that is that even the likelihood of when you do these tests that you're gonna find the monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. And we, and, and in fact, those patients are even more difficult to figure out because they don't have any symptoms and may not have, they may not have major symptoms, but still we watch those people carefully because they could transform into multiple myeloma. Craig, tell us about disparities. We have to touch on that because yes. without the discussion, we don't have clarity and we certainly don't make progress. You're involved in lots of clinical trials. Touch on the disparities of, uh, for the listening, the, the viewing audience, in terms of where we're at, uh, uh, some of the percentages uh, in terms of myeloma. And, and you know, I, I was in Africa last year and I'm saying, boy, just sitting here listening to you, I'm saying, boy, a lot of folks oh. need to be tested just in the countries I visited, so, not to mention what we're dealing with here in, in the States. So the, to, to, to touch on that, the, the World Health Organization looked at this. The lowest incidence of multiple myeloma in the world is in Africa. When the, we know that the highest incidence and the highest risk of this disease is in people of African descent. The reason why the incidence is so low in Africa isn't because there isn't any myeloma in Africa, it's because they're it's not they, we diagnosed. Don't have the testing. Mm -hmm. Not diagnosed, yes. We don't have the testing, which, is, which means that there are people who are dying of this disease in countries around, really around the world, but specifically in Africa, without getting a diagnosis. When even, and it is treat, there are ways to treat myeloma without using the fanciest drugs, without using the fanciest things. Even here in the United States, the, again, the incidence of myeloma for African Americans using U.S. data is one, is at 18 per 100,000. Everybody knows about melanoma, but melanoma is one in 100,000. Myeloma is 18 times more common per 100,000 than melanoma. But everybody knows about melanoma. Every primary care doctor and myself knows how to look at a mole. Yeah, right, we look at be between the toes and everywhere else. To know yes. about, mm -hmm. but myeloma, much higher incidence, much higher incidence. And so that is one of the largest disparities that we have is that it, it doesn't get diagnosed um, in a timely manner. Lots of studies showing that blacks and whites, blacks, have, blacks and women have a longer time, almost double the time from, um, uh, to be diagnosed compared to whites. And the time to get to treatment is twice as long for blacks compared to whites. So if we're not diagnosing it, that means we will never get to treatment properly. We we'll never get the treatment properly. And when you talk about, and you mentioned clinical trials, 20% uh, if we don't diagnose the myeloma, then how can a, you know, people of African descent go on clinical trials? So we know that 20% of the U.S. population of, of myeloma is black. And the FDA has looked at this twice, that of, of drugs that have gone to the F, myeloma drugs have gone to the FDA for approval, only 5%, 4.5%, I rounded up, 4.5% of patients on those clinical trials were black. So how do you know that these drugs will work as well for whites and blacks when only 5% of the patients on those trials were black? Right. We should, or have we learned our lesson 
Uh, we went through this with breast cancer and tamoxifen as opposed to, you know, black females as opposed to white females in, in terms of treatment and outcomes, but you're not part of the study. How do we know it works? Is access playing a role in this also? So access plays a tremendous role. Um, there have been you know, lots, thank goodness there have been lots of studies mm -hmm. that have looked at one of the things that, I, that we found out is one, African Americans treated with the same drugs th that as white patients. So there's a study done through the VA system. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets the same therapy mm -hmm. through the VA, mm -hmm. regardless of, of insurance mm -hmm. status. That blacks actually have a better, better survival response. and better response than their white counterparts given equal access to, to therapy. However, outside of that, there was a study that was just at our last uh, American Society of Hematology meeting showing that black race had poorer survivals, but when controlled for insurance, they had actually the same if not better. So it is access and the cost of care that is that that is plays a significant role in some of the disparities in myeloma. So if we don't approach this properly, we're part of the problem. We're part the of the problem. The system is part of the problem. Yes, yes, because black pa there are black patients that have this disease that don't get the newest therapy, that don't they get diagnosed late, and and I can tell you that every every day that we have a new patient we have to jump through a lot of hoops at Michigan State to get these medications paid for. And some places in this country don't have the resources to find how these drugs can get paid for. Or how can we, you know, talk to the insurance, I spend a lot of time talking to insurance companies, oh. begging for them to treat my patients. And, but if you don't have, you know, if you don't have the resources to do that, then how can you deliver equal care to patients? Exactly, we, we can't fight a war if you've got the bullets and I got the gun, it, it doesn't work. Exactly. Right. So, so, so let's, let's touch a little bit on the, the relationships with patients in terms of trust. Patients are suspicious regardless, mm -hmm. okay? And one of the reasons is because we have information overload in this country. They get information from all kinds of places. I'm amazed that some of the things that people come in and say, can we try this? And you say, eh, right, you know. But, but here again, is that playing a role in terms of, of uh, trying to approach this disease state and get the proper care, make the diagnosis? Do you see some of the pushback that, that we're seeing in other disease states? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I think there's been, you know, in the past 10 years that we have really, you know, the myeloma societies, the myeloma community has really gone out. I mean, I, I give you that, you know, doing talks at churches and doing talks at society meetings and doing patient advocacy talks and really focusing in and saying that, that black myeloma is mm -hmm. a different disease is finally, I think, is beginning to trickle down where the awareness of this disease is starting to brew and starting to come about, where is, is you know, people saying, gosh, you know, are there other ways to treat this disease? You know, are there any alternative therapies? You know, we're always willing to work with alternative therapies, but the important point is education and educating patients and empowering patients. You know, not dis when, if they want to try something new or if they have an idea or if they want to do something, is to educate, validate and educate, and then pay and partner with patients instead of, of dis, you know, disengaging them, really helps with you know, having patients and doctors on the same path with the same goals, getting the same outcome. So getting the word out. Getting the word right. out. Right, you know, it's not enough for us to have these discussions internally or uh, amongst our professional colleagues necessarily, but this needs to be a more broad spread approach to educating a community, a family, a society, uh, a, a group, uh, you know, the block club, whatever. Yeah, I always, I always worry about, you know, one of my, you know, older patients with myeloma that goes to church and, you know, that may have had a transplant and she can't talk to other people in her church about myeloma. 
he, she could talk about breast cancer, she could talk about colon, everybody knows about breast cancer, everybody knows about colon cancer. Myeloma takes a patient that has a really good understanding of immunology, it takes another person with a very good understanding of immunology to understand what they have about the plasma cell. Because people don't talk about plasma cells. They kind of got to speak the same language. They have to speak the same language. And so the more that we can educate the community, the more that we talk about myeloma and how this affects our community, the more likely that, that, that lady that I worry about going to church mm -hmm. will engage somebody that says, yeah, I heard about that. Is that what you have? And then she feels, you know, that she feels validated in her own safe space. Your passion comes through in, the, in this conversation. There's always a story behind, you know, folks like us that, you know, that got us to, to where we are in terms of, of uh, how we feel about what we do. What, what's, what's, what was the impetus behind all of this for you? So I, um, when I got to Michigan, so my dad died of colon cancer, my grandfather died of prostate cancer. My grandmother took care of both of them. And after she buried my grandfather, she told us that she had colon cancer. She knew she had colon cancer, but she had to take care of my grandfather and my, and my dad. So she put her situation on hold. Put her situation on hold. So I, you know, I went to college and she was getting chemotherapy and, and I was trying to settle in. And she said, Craig, I want you to come down and take me to my appointment. So this was three months, four, four months into college. So I drove down and, um, and she was in a lot of pain. She was doing poorly. It took us a half hour to get her down the stairs uh, because she was in so much pain. And driving to Sinai Hospital right, you know, right here, you know, every bump in the road, you know, she felt it. And so I helped her get out of the car. We went into the doctor's office. She sat there. And then the doctor burst in, did knock, and said, Vesta, your cancer is getting worse. We're going to start new chemotherapy on Monday. It's hard to turn around. And my grandmother said, um, I want to go on hospice. And she, her doctor turned around and just leveled every insult you could possibly deliver to her and saying that she was stupid for making this decision, that why would she do this, and just went on. My grandmother just smiled and then looked over to me and said, Craig, you can take me home now. So I un so we went down. I was devastated, of course. Well, we go to the car, and I start putting her you know, back in the car, and then she grabs my hand and says, son, I think you can do a better job than that lady. And in that moment, I was like, that's it. I, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do oncology. And she went home. She called her friends because she was at LPN. She called her friends, put herself on hospice. And the lesson I learned is patient empowerment. She was empowered to go to her doctor, who I'm sure had mistreated her the whole time, told her what she wanted to do. And even when her doctor said no, she empowered herself to do that. So the passion that I carry is to empower my colleagues, educate my colleagues, teach the students, but empower patients like my grandmother was empowered. 2024, and we're still stumbling over some of the basics mm -hmm. in terms of patient care. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's amazing how we've gotten so off track with some of these things. Let's shift gears for just a minute. We, we could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> What, what's coming down the pike? Any futuristic oh, stuff in terms of the goodness. treatment of multiple myeloma? Yes, yes. So we have, we definitely have our eyes on the cure. As you said at the beginning, that it is an incurable blood cancer, but we are working to cure it. And I think that there are people who we have cured. We just haven't done it long enough ago to see that we've cured it. And it is really using these new T cell engagement therapies to get the T cells that should destroy cancer cells to ignore the, the um, uh, that have been ignoring the plasma cells, to redirect them to kill the cancer cells has really been revolutionary. Also, 
genomic therapy that we've yes. been using. Yes. So there's a study that shows that, that people of African descent are more likely to have a specific translocation of chromosome 11 and 14 that increases BCL2 in the myeloma cells, which keeps them alive, and using a BCL2 inhibitor for black patients, for patients with 1114, and again, enriched for black patients, lowers it. And one of the highest response rates we've seen in myeloma is by using genomic-directed therapy. And so that is just the beginning of, of all the innovations coming down the pipeline. That's amazing. That's amazing. Out, outstanding uh, discussion, Greg. I mean, just, we thank you so much for, for joining us here today. Um, our guest has been Dr. Craig Cole, Director of Clinical Research in Hematology and Oncology and Multiple Myeloma at Michigan State College of Medicine and the Carmanos Cancer Center. Craig, thank you so much for joining us yes. today. We will do this again. Yeah, okay. thank you. Good, good. Increasing awareness uh, and access to adequate health care and participation in clinical trials are a few of the ways to reduce the incidence of myeloma and improve treatment. We should all be aware of these options, no matter who you are, in terms of the treatment scheme or where you fall into the insurance scheme or whatever else we do. Patients need to be fully aware and be full participants in their care. Thank you for joining us for Primary Care. I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe.